great. Hello, friends, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 333rd New Social Environment. I'm Catherine, and I have the pleasure of being your MC today for a conversation between Janaina Chepe and David Rhodes. We're also very lucky to have the poet Sarah Jean Grimm here, who will read to close out our program. We start all of our events with two important acknowledgments. The first is that here in New York, we are in Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second acknowledgement is that Black Lives Matter. At the heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all those who struggle for freedom. And in the words of Angela Davis, when it comes to liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation. In that spirit, I encourage you all to check out the chat for a living document of resources and actions, and I'll po post that link shortly. Um, and now to briefly introduce our guest and host today, artist Janina Chepe lives and works in New York. Her exhibition with Ursula Ruder Christensen just opened at the Den Fry Center of Contemporary Art in Copenhagen and her solo show at Sean Kelly Gallery also just opened just this past week. And I'll post links to both of those in the chat. Our host, our artist and writer, David Rhodes, is a regular contributor to the Brooklyn Rail, and he has paintings in the permanent collections of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston and the Museum, the Huntington Museum in Los Angeles. And I'll be posting links to full bios in the chat, but for now, um, David. Take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, to talk to Janaina about her work. Uh, I'd like to start by asking her something about the exhibition at uh, Sean Kelly here in New York City. Uh, I noticed, I think, um, something of a change uh, between this, this current exhibition and the previous exhibition from 2018 in the same gallery. Uh, I think there's a change in tone, a change in palette. Um, and I was wondering if you could say something about um, how you feel about this um, uh, development in your work, especially over uh, such a difficult um, period. I mean, it must have been a challenge to prepare for an exhibition. So. Right. Hi. So hi, everyone. <laughs> yes, I, I, I think this whole past year and a half for everyone was a challenge. And, but at the same time, I think we all might have experienced also more time in terms of like being immersed in, in each universe. And I think there was more time for reflection and there was a little bit of downtime of all social events and everything that goes around our lives on a daily basis. And I think that I did have um, that time to sort of dive in into really a reflection upon my paintings. I spent the first couple of months of the pandemic in Brazil in the countryside. Mm -hmm where I had a lot of like silence and nature and animals around me. And, uh, and I was working for my show at the Orangerie, which was a dialogue with Monet. So this, the whole setting seemed pretty perfect for it in a way, you know, serving nature and having kind of that repetition also of looking at the same landscape while I was walking to my studio every day. And then I came to New York and um, and I spent from August last year, I was here and I moved into this temporary studio where I started to prepare for my show. And I, I do think that, you know, the accumulation of the time in, in Brazil and the countryside and coming here with all that baggage in a way and then preparing for the show here obviously informed this new body of work. And I think I tapped into a space where I think the, one of the big changes in terms of material is that I started painting with um, oil sticks instead of watercolor crayons. And I think that that was sort of a step that 
led me into a different space, not only in the material space, but also mental space because the marks changed. So I think that's a pretty big shift in terms of the mark making and also the color palette because obviously with the oil sticks, you have an arrange of um, colors that is much wider. Um, so there was a limitation in a way with the watercolor sticks and the, you know, because of the, basically the, the material itself, like didn't have so and you can't mix them as much and you can't invent things and with oil it does it's more malleable more fluid you can actually um, do one mark on top of the other and mix those colors so you have a kind of more endless sort of possibility so in a way that's how I felt like I was really tapping into a uh, different space of painting <sighs> Uh, Henry, could we have the first image, please? So um, I can I can see exactly uh, what you mean about the um, development in the work from the um, simple change in using oil stick, change in uh, medium. The, um, the drawing seems very consistent. It seems um, carried through from your um, previous works. But the, the, uh, what I call a tone seems uh, a, a little different. Um, there's, um, as you described, the complexity in the color that the oil stick um, allows, but also a uh, a kind of restraint or brevity in the chromatism. The, uh, your, your previous show seemed um, lighter for some reason. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a, a false impression, but uh, it seems no, it's, it's correct. I think yeah. it is correct. I mean, I think also that, uh, uh, well, I mean, I started working on that body of work around November, which was winter. Okay. So obviously there is an influence, you know, of the color palette just when, if you let it in, you know, which I kind of, I think, decided to, because then I, um, in, in the beginning of the spring and of winter, I started going also upstate to the Hudson Valley. And I, I, actually worked on some of those paintings there, especially like the big one. And I think that the paintings, as much as they are not sort of an illustration of nature or, you know, made off a landscape that I see immediately in front of me, I did allow sort of the atmosphere and the, the, the weather, the kind of go through me and so because I had this also this different material to work with that gave me all these other options you know I did dive more into trying to figure out how to you know to make that color palette broader from where I was before and I kind of challenged myself a little bit especially like think in a way like especially when I was upstate and I kept seeing fog, you know, I, I was always thinking like, how do I actually subtract and extract the color out of the fog? What is underneath it, you know? So there was sometimes like little challenges that I imposed myself like a game to bring me to certain places. And I think that, um, I was really interested in trying to carve out the color of underneath surfaces in a way. So obviously the colors are not as, as um, you know, I think that my previous show had more greens or blues, you know, it was a little, it was brighter. It was more, um, it, there, there wasn't so, like here, I think that there was, there is an underlying idea of color that I wanted to bring out. Sure, sure. Um, Henry, could we have the uh, next slide, please? Uh, thank you. 
and, and now move on to the next slide. Thank you. This uh, painting is, um, uh, isn't it substantially larger than paintings you've made before? This is the painting you described as a challenge. Yes, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, um, definitely is. And I, and I think also in that particular material, I mean, I, I work on large scale murals. I did large scale paintings before, I think, it, the specific challenge for this one was in a way to paint that in that different material that I had never like used before in that scale. And also the horizon, the long format, you know, which is always, I think a challenge because, you know, in my previous show, I had very large scale paintings, but they were all sort of, they, they stay in your vision field when you are standing in front of them. And this one, you do have to step back a lot to get it into your vision field. So I was very interested in how to, in a way, conquer yes. that space, you know, to be able to move from left to right, right to left, you know, um, without taking the painting apart, without making it become a story, but kind of more an all around, you know, on, you know, complex understanding of like how the composition works together. Yes, yeah. I think um, with a painting on this, um, at this size, as you're describing, there's a different um, temporal experience for both the artist uh, and the viewer, because uh, encountering it <clears throat> requires some movement and there's a different um, experience of the painting from different positions. And I, I imagine in the making of it, uh, it, had, it, it must have a very strong physical performative dimension. And I wondered if that... Um... It definitely does. And that is, I think, part of the challenge because I, I work um, on a scaffold, I have a small scaffold on, on wheels that I can move back and forth and it's not too heavy. So it's kind of malleable and, um, but it's still, I have to go, you know, up the scaffold, down the scaffold. Like once I'm up on the scaffold, it will take a little bit to go down. Like if, you know, and then to walk back, move the scaffold to another position while obviously when you can reach out all the painting from the spot, you know, you're mo much more immediate. You know, you think of composition, you start with a blue on the right hand side, you kind of can finish it on the left without really a much thought in between. I mean, the thought is then just one, instead of like going down from the scaffold, stepping back to first take in the whole composition again and then find out where that blue should go. So there is a spontaneity that is very different because it, there's movement in between and it's quite exhausting actually <laughs> because you, I really, I try to keep that same flow, which is a challenge. I try to keep that same flow that I can start on the left with a brush, especially the first layers of the painting that are really broad um, brush strokes and they have a, a very gestural component to them and you know the challenge is really like how how to keep that brush stroke one from one side of the canvas to the other mm -hmm. so that does require obviously to be fast and to you know almost like running from one side of the canvas to the other because mm -hmm. it is so large yes yeah i think uh, you described um initially um, painting uh, a, a, a gray color across the entire uh, linen surface before you began the mark making. Um, it's an interesting stage in the painting because you um, kind of es establish yourself as um, participating. It's not an object apart from you once you've made that first layer of color. Then you work, you start the dialogue, the conversation or the game with yourself to discover 
uh, what the painting will be. And um, it, given that these paintings are so recent uh, and there are new aspects in them, it must be um, difficult for you to describe uh, some of these um, developments because uh, you're also becoming acquainted with the paintings. They're new to you as well. Uh, I think sometimes for artists, for painters particularly, uh, they, they need to become uh, used to their own work. They're, they're also a viewer. You know, pe they're in a similar position in a sense to people who come to look at the paintings who haven't seen them before. But for the artists, they're potentially estranging um, new uh, images too. They take time to absorb, they're not instantaneous. It, absolutely right. I mean, I think that that's what also creates in a way this anxiety of cre creating the new one because by, you know, by every painting you, you're in a learning process. Mm -hmm. With that painting, you're getting to know it. You're getting to know the material deeper. You're getting to know how how it works. You know, and with the size is the same. Like I, I want to paint another one the same size, just to mm -hmm. apply the knowledge that I, you know, that I uh, gained from painting that one. So it it does create this sort of happy anxiety in a way mm -hmm. to continue that flow because it is absolutely like. I think all my work is very process driven, you know, I, the process is always informing the next steps. So it is hard to talk about it sometimes because I'm in the same sort of moment of discovery. Yes, yes. Could, could we have the next image, Henry, please? We can see a closer view of the same painting. Uh, I, I felt with this painting that um, there's both a, a recessive um, interlacing of uh, lines, a different kind of space, to um, some of the shapes that are almost tessellated. They, they uh, fit together in different ways. So the, the two, the two um, uh, ways of mark, mark making um, animate the painting. They, they um, make it unpredictable across the surface. It's um, several different ways of um, creating the painting that are occurring simultaneously. Yes, I think this is the fascination and the, and, um, you know, to, to really be in that dialogue where you're raising, you're creating, you are sort of uh, relating one shape to the other, but then you want to relate it a little less. So it, it becomes very much a life. It's like a living sort of organic <laughs> um, dialogue between shapes and forms and colors, you know, that are, that also are in constant question. Like I'm the, constantly questioning them, adding, playing with them to see how they would work in, a, in an opposite way. So it is a, it is a playing chess, it is a puzzle a little bit. And then I think for me, like even now looking at the painting when, when I was um, in the gallery the other day, like I still discovered too some other things in relationships because sometimes I'm thinking of that relationship and then I discover the other relationship another shape that is in the painting as well so there is an addition of a, like basically an accumulation of a vocabulary that I've been using for a long time and then it keeps expanding right right this um this vocabulary is it is it um like a language is it like a, a number of signs or is it like a, a line can have a different um, uh, impact? It can be restrained or it can be aggressive. All these things are available 
within that vocabulary that you're describing. Yes, I think very much. I mean, there was a while I would write um, poetry, for instance, but I would try to translate poetry not into words, but into signs. I would try to make almost like drawings or just a, or, or like a, a very thick line, a very thin line, a round line, like to try to understand and sort of a map out a little bit what the emotional can um, be, how the emotional can be translated into mark making into those different, you know, the tones and 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 how you sketch things and how, what that brings into what kind of information that brings into the painting. So I think over the years I did accumulate, you know, a lot of like different science mark making and I keep challenging them and I keep changing them around. I think every painting there is something that happens that um, will question something that I did before. Mm -hmm. so, so you, um, the paintings um, throw up new questions rather than um, answer a kind of inquiry that, that, that they, they're like, they, they guide you a different way or you discover new things. Um, yes, yes. I think I've, that's very much also what excites me a lot is to be obviously always like questioning something that I, that I thought was resolved that way or thought was, you know, um, works that way. But yeah. then obviously there's a hundred alternatives to how this can be looked at. And, and I, that's very exciting to me. Oh, could, could we have the next image, Henry, please? Thank you. Um, well, this is, this is a somewhat different painting. It's, um, it's more open in a way. It's less dense. It has less of that interlacing drawing. Uh, how, how do you come to a, de a decision to, to, to do you, is, the, is the process that you decide to leave it um, with less drawing, or, or is it a kind of, um, uh, is it kind of decided um, as soon as I you- I mean, I, yeah, I think it's a, always this challenge, you know, that, um, I mean, when you're sketching, when you're drawing, you know, there's some things that sometimes one brushstroke resolves the canvas because that brushstroke is so perfect in a way whatever perfect means but in that moment for you you know like because sometimes I think we do have those challenges where subcon subconsciously also you're trying to achieve a certain thing I think maybe like when you're playing an instrument and you're trying to play a note or a tune and and without having the whole um, music elements to it, but sometimes you achieve something in one word, in mm -hmm. one gesture. So I think there is that moment where I want to be free to leave certain things in that state. And sometimes I want to challenge that stage, destroy it in a way and continue it. So I think that those are all different options that I want to keep open and for me that painting um when i started working on that painting i i really like drew it in a very um sketchful way all across the canvas and it was one of these moments where it was very fluid and i continued sketching it and i wanted that moment to prevail and to stay there Right, right. Could we have the next um, image? Thank you. Uh, so I, I wanted to, um, it's interesting uh, to me that you mentioned conscious, unconscious, and um, the relationship between <clears throat> an, an image that can be identified and an image which is um, comprises uh, mark making or, or formal elements. Uh, it, it, it recalls automatic writing or, you know, a way of working where what's 
uh, referred to as the unconscious, plays a role. <clears throat> so there are moments when there are uh, kind of rational decisions about what one would like, and then things appear from somewhere because uh, in, in your case, you're, you're open and you allow these things to happen. Um, and I was thinking uh, about an artist like Edvard Munch and, and her, there's such <clears throat> inventive paintings, there's such psychological paintings. Um, and yet they, <clears throat> they depict something we can clearly see, but that's just the beginning of the story about what makes them so uh, powerful. So uh, you, you also seem to be able to move, um, to, to incorporate these things. These things are, are all uh, energies within the same um, uh, image, same piece of work. They have the physical uh, presence and they have a, um, an image. The two things uh, develop uh, each other. Yes, I think this is exactly, I think, what not the, the fascination or the search, in a way, like how to create that dy dynamic between, you know, there, there are images and there are, um, you know, we, we create some, some sort of uh, inner universe. There is like an inner space where you are surrounded by by your own imagery that you feel when you hear a storm, when you see a sunset, you know, we, we incorporate all this and we relate it to feelings or to things that we're going through at that moment. And I think it's quite interesting to me and a challenge to try to not illustrate, but like insert that universe with together with that dialogue with the paint, you know, with a more rational sort of decomposing of painting and brush and strokes and mark making and how to interlace that so that one, that both are there, you know, in a, in a sort of strange balance. Sure. I mean, it, with, with your um, painting, there's always a tactility together with the um, color. So that they have the, the, um, the presence of a, of a physical object and the, the associ associative power of um, colors. And uh, uh, I can see that the, there's um, a relationship between nature and memory and experience. And um, thinking of your biography of the um, fact that you were born in Munich and raised in, was it, uh, in Brazil, and that since then you've, you've traveled between the two uh, places, um, even though you, 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 you now live in New York and have done for 23 years. So yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, I was, um, I wanted to ask you, um, there's something that Elizabeth Bishop, the poet, calls um, cross-cultural contact zones. Uh, and she believed it transformed her own poetry. Um, her, in her case, she lived in Brazil between 1951 and 1979. But that experience of moving between cultures uh, affected the form of her poetry, the content, um, and I, I wonder uh, for yourself. Uh, I mean, I think one of the things that I think is interesting is anyway, like when you move, right, as, as, a, as a teenager or as a child from one um, country to another one, especially like mm -hmm. Germany, Brazil, which are quite different countries and mentalities, you know, you're forced outside of your comfort zone because you're thrown into a different context and you have to start, you have to speak another language. You have to start, you know, you, you start understanding the different signs. You know, I think it's always, there is this adaptation 
to basically know how relationships happen and how you're supposed to function in this new place. And that is almost like an exercise in a way that to me mirrors very much, you know, sometimes the, the process of the dialogue I have with the canvas where I'm trying always to get outside of my comfort zone, relate to something new and bring obviously, you know, the, the my knowledge to it that I have until then, but sort of be open to adapt and to bring in that new territory, that new thought, that new idea. And I think that that's something that um, people experience very much when they move, you know, from one place mm-hmm. to another. Mm-hmm. And and Brazil and Germany are very interesting, I think, um, very extremely different places. You know, my father was German, my mom is Brazilian, so we also had that at home, you know, that kind Mm -hmm. of different um, way of expressing emotions, different way of being rational, different way of relating to one another. So obviously being in in those countries also, I mean, the when I grew up in Brazil, you know, I was in school, it was military dictature still. So it was a very different way that education happened and that the relationship to the teacher or to authority in general. Mm-hmm. And then we moved to Germany and it was completely different in school. And then I was a teenager in Germany and started questioning things, but start, started reading Hermann Hesse and, you know, getting to know good and more profoundly Thomas Mann so in a way my teenagehood in Germany I think that was a very big influence of uh, the German soul in a way you know mm-hmm. angst and that you know sort of questioning and and then I went back to Brazil and brought that with me again so I think that that kind of does inform the work a lot until today that sort of a dialogue between places and cultures not only in a in a way that you know about like the different um climate or the different nature but also I think that is just somehow like a a, a, the outside but the inside you know that kind of dialogue to Mm -hmm. that informs it very much right right um Henry could we have from the next slide So moving from one painting to the next, there's um, a very different experience of light and um, the communication of a a particular landscape, perhaps, or, or, uh, um, um, or a particular memory scape. Maybe it's, uh, I get the sense that the paintings uh, are very different from each other because there's a very particular source initially that's developed very differently. So can we have the next slide, Henry? Thanks. Um, And and in the drawings, similarly, um, they differ from each other very much too. There's not a sense of uh, a serial development. They have a commonality but each one has its own determining character. Um, I'd just like to say that they, in the exhibition, um, the paintings are in uh, one of the galleries um, rooms and the drawings are in a, a separate uh, room. It's very interesting to see um, the difference, the, the, the linearity, the graphic element um, in, in, in a drawing. Um, rather than in a, in a painting, and how the two are in um, conversation. Can we have the next um, image, please, Henry? And now the next one. Thank you. The um, piece we're looking at is uh, a composite piece. It's a number of works on paper that um, have been um, placed next to each other to make a larger work. And um, I wonder if you could describe the process 
of arriving at this from the individual uh, works on paper? Yeah, I mean, I think that I started doing those polyptics um, basically mostly at night when I would be, you know, drawing on my living room table, I would get smaller pieces of paper and make drawings. And then I wanted to connect them to the next drawing. So I started with one and I put, put it down on the floor. I would do the next one without laying it next to it because for me, it was interesting to understand what of the composition remained in my memory, in my head, so that I could continue as if it would be next to it, but it's not physically next to it. Because there is, a, to me, an interesting idea like of how that it could live by itself, but how would it be related to the other one? So it's not like putting all the papers on the wall and working on it as one. Yeah. That, to me, wouldn't make as much sense because then I could just get a bigger piece of paper, basically. I like the idea that I'm creating relationships of possibilities. So there are times that I also like would draw one and then flip it upside down and kind of play with it in the composition and then continue. So there's several layers of, of the process where I start first, you know, making one after the other and laying them down. And then I have... I obviously start looking at it and, and studying it and then I add more layers to it so it keeps growing so it's, I don't necessarily always know how big it will end up being because it's I keep adding them on and sort of playing around with the composition until I feel that there's something that I like to stay that way right right mm -hmm. Could we see the next um, image, please, Henry? So um, this this is the only work on paper not made in New York. Is that is that right? This one, I yes. think this one this is made in Brazil. This uh, was made in Brazil, exactly. Yeah, and to me, it it I, it seems like there is a um, either a rock or a body, and it seems to be submerged. And the, the drawing seems um, very um, fugitive. It seems very um, free of the, the actual forms that they have a very um, uh, animated relationship. I, I wonder if you could say something about this piece because it, it seems more connected to the paintings, um, but mm -hmm. not the forms. it's different again. I mean, I think that uh, uh, there is a different play a little bit about, you know, when you, for me, like when I draw with, with, with those, they are all water syllable sticks. So basically I'm painting with um, watercolor. So there is a different thought process in the layering because basically if I paint over the drawing, the drawing dissolves and I can make it sort of disappear or faint. Mm -hmm. And there is different ideas of like, you know, drying out layers of paint and then drawing on top. So it's, it's interlaced. There is a possibility, which with the big canvases, for example, in the oil, I, I cannot paint in casting on top of oil it wouldn't allow me so there's a very different thought process but and which gives it a playful sort of like um because I can keep erasing I add layers to it so it kind of becomes more interlaced and inside and it floats in a different way it's sure. it's less on top of it but kind of in between and underneath so it could be the, the joys could be also submerged in it. So it gives a, it's a, it's, it is a very different um, way of look of, of, for me, of working on. And um, yes. it does create a very different field, space yeah. where they float in a way. Yeah, yeah. I th uh, um, th thematically, the, um... The idea of um, water or, or 
or sea or ocean. It seems uh, one of the core uh, concerns in, in your work. And this um, certainly um, in, indicates that, that interest, I think, not only in the, the nature of the image, but as you're describing, the, the processes that you engage in, the, the, the relationship between the watercolor pencil and the watercolor and how um, their liquidity can, can adapt and modify the image. Um, I mean, I think for me, I, I, I did a, a video piece many years ago, which was a performance that I recorded um, where I had this simple th thought in a way, like I woke up in the morning and I thought about how much water we lose at night while we sleep and where does it all go into that mattress? Like I kept looking at my mattress thinking that the accumulation of sleeping every day and losing fluids because we do lose much more than we are aware of in a way, you know, while we sleep. And, and I started to imagine this accumulation of all that fluid and all that um, humidity. And I did a, a, a video piece where I inserted a giant balloon inside a mattress and I kept pumping water in it. So the video is basically that bad that explodes at some point because I thought, you know, at some point that water must get out. I had, so in a way, I think I have a big fascination with the the fluid universe in all kinds of ways. I mean, from mythology and sirens to the real idea that, you know, um, water can be solid and then you can melt it again. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think it does, uh, I, I revisit that notion in different aspects, in the painting I did in the videos and in the performances before. I do, some, like, also when I write and reflect about things, I think there was always a very big fascination of being able, in a way, to disappear, to dissolve, you know, the not being material, not being there, and what, what, like, how, and when you submerge in the water, what it does to you. What, so, um, I think I keep expanding that idea into different mediums and materials, but it is uh, something that you can see throughout the work, I think. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, Henry, could we, could we see the next um, two images? Um, could you, thanks, and just move on from them so we can see the, the range of um, Janina's um, drawings um, because I think we uh, we should move to a um, another exhibition that's currently uh, uh, in Denmark in Copenhagen okay this is good thank you um, at um, Den Free it's a two-person show with Ursula Reuter Christiansen and um, I wonder um, this is a very different context now. Um, and included in this exhibition are, I think, um, photographs, sculptures, a video piece, and paintings. Yes. yes. The exhibition we've um, been discussing is, is your painting and drawing, but your um, practice is um, uh, extensive. It's very diverse. And as you just described, um, your, your interest in water and its um, various manifestations and meanings is transferred across the various uh, media that you use. So yes, actually in this show, you know, I showed, um, I think we have a slide of it. Of, I, I showed a piece called Lacrima Corpus. And it's actually a nice example because this was shot in Germany, for instance. Maybe we find the slide here. Um, could we move and see that one? That one, perfect. That piece, um, 
was shot in, in Weimar in Germany. And I, I borrowed uh, an outfit from like the first Faust play from the theater, you know, which was which happened in Weimar. And this was a summer residence from Goethe. Nice. And in the and in the background you see uh, this path through the forest, which is named Zeitschneiden, which is basically a cut in time, yeah. and where Goethe would you know, do the talks, the walks in nature and recite poetry and be involved in nature and that. Uh, and well, and then during the Second World War, the Nazis decided to make a concentration camp in Buchenwald, right in the back of where mm -hmm. she's watching out the window. It was a lot of layers of, you know, Weimar is a very uh, loaded place with a lot of history and layers of uh, Bauhaus, Goethe, you know, then Buchenwald, and it did fascinate me a lot. And I did this performance, and and I she has those tears around her neck, basically, in a way. Um, those are little balloons and condoms inflated with air, but it is in a way a body of water, lacrima corpus, body of tears, mm -hmm. because for me this, you know, the the accumulation of emotions and accumulation of so much like how to how to live with it in a way you know how to show it how to envision it without you know in a in a way like uh in a in a so i was trying to 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 imagine all this accumulation of so much uh pain in history and right, right. And for me, that sort of visualizations of like basically carrying your tears around you, you know, in a in a numb way, you know, mm -hmm. kind of was a a way of trying to deal with all that. Mm -hmm. And so, so we're showing that piece in the show because we we call the whole show um, is called the Uncanny. Mm -hmm. And I, Ursula is also, she's German. She was my first professor in art school when I studied in Hamburg. And she has a history also like of a performance and she's a painter. So I think that there is in any way, like there was a whole generation and is a female performance artist, you know, trying to uh, visualize, deal with a lot of the history in a, in a, Right. formative way, which I think did influence me a lot in in the beginning of my career and uh, when I went to art school. So when we started talking about that show, we decided to sort of put elements of video as well and painting and, and, and create that dialogue. Yes. Is, so this, this piece is not, not only a photograph, it exists as a video and it was a performance. Yes. Yeah. There, I mean, she basically starts turning around, you know, it's shot from a camera from above and she starts turning around faster and faster, basically drilling a lot, a, a, until she falls to the floor mm -hmm. in exhaustion. Yeah. So it's just a, it's a very, it's a silent performance. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it basically has a little bit of that numbness and that sort of, but trying to deal with time, trying to deal with our own, but in a very, in a way, silent way, but a physical way as well. Right, right, right. I, th I think we have, um, can we see the next uh, image, please? And the next one? Uh, I think the, so we want to say something I more think about yeah the blood sea image I think maybe the other video that we have in the we should, show we should move there did you say something about this because we haven't talked much about your video yeah so this this 
video piece. It's mm -hmm. uh, called Blood Sea after a quote from Calvino. Italo Calvino wrote a short story um, that I found very striking when I read it because it was basically describing how we, when we became, you know, um, little animals from bacteria in a way that we went out of the water and in, incorporated the ocean inside of us to be able to breathe outside the water and that the water of the ocean is in our veins, it's basically our blood. Which goes back to what we were talking about the water and I was mentioning about, you know, that my fascination yeah. of like that universe. Um, so Blood Sea, you know, I read that that uh, short story of Calvino and that quote really stayed with me. And um, I discovered there was a, a underwater theater in Florida, Wikiwatch Springs, where in the 60s, you know, they had mermaid shows. You know, it's a natural spring. It was like an aquarium in a way, a little bit surreal and uh, tacky, you know, but what? And so I went down there and I created costumes. I created costumes like you see here, the white one, the black one. I created uh, outfits that would blow up and also float on the water with balloons inside and different colors and tank te tentacles. So the, the performance on the water was a very simple one in a way because I think that I'm not looking exactly for a narrative when I shoot the videos, but I am looking for a development of what happens in the process. So basically I did create the costumes and I met the mermaids there, that those are the professional mermaids that were working in the theater. And I kind of just um, brought them together, you know, without now giving a script or any sort of guidance of how they, how I wanted them to move or not, but it, I'm always fascinated by these encounters, like how this then could relate. You know, they were used to do the mermaid, the little mermaid show from Walt Disney underwater. And then I brought in those costumes for them to try on and basically be in the water with them. And, and, and of course, this is a freshwater spring. So there is a under um, tow and there's turbulence in the water. So everything started floating around and, and um, actually in the like, first day she actually got entangled and almost drowned. So we had to sort of uh, <laughs> bring them apart and put little weights and balloons to start really almost like making a painting underwater, you know, start stretching them and understanding the water flow, understanding where things would move in faster or not, and then make a balance between the elements that were floating on top and the elements that would sink to the bottom. Mm -hmm. So it did, at, the, at that time, I wasn't uh, working so much on large scale canvases or canvases at all. I was drawing more and I was really trying to sort of paint with the performances, you know, in nature, sort of bring that out and try to compose things, um, sort of taking in the process of nature, which obviously like I can't control, you know, the, the water or what happens in there, or if there's a snapping turtle, you know, like it's all those elements that in a way do come in into the, the work. Mm -hmm. So um, I wonder if we should um, have oh, some yeah. questions. Sorry? Yes, yes, I forgot it's, uh, I forgot the time. <laughs> I think um, we should have some questions. Yeah, yeah, we've had some lovely comments and questions come in throughout the conversation. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, our first question comes from our friend, Lynn. Lynn, I'm going to pass you a mic now. Thank you. Thank you so much for this stunning presentation. And the whole time I was watching from the very beginning to the end, I thought how um, 
it could be a, a lesson in how viewing, the best viewing becomes collaboration. Because the more, the more there, there's so much to interact with and when you do, it, it comes right back at you. Um, and I, I guess I, my question is if you're conscious of that and just the other thing I wanted to say, a lot of people loved this cross-cultural zone, that comment that you made. And then I was thinking you could fit in so many other words besides cultural, like cross psychological zone, cross aesthetic zone, cross energetic zone. So again, there's this masterful sort of balance between things that often aren't put together or if they are not as seamlessly as you do, but there's such an energy to it. So. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a place that I am very fascinated and that I always try to look for that. I mean, that's what I was saying in regards to the performance, you know, to submerge something that I create in the water and to try to deal with that dialogue with the water or with mm -hmm. the canvases, the size, the scale and the brush. So there is always, for me, there is a search of trying to, um, in, you know, deal with the unknown and let the unknown in and sort of, mm -hmm find out what space that can create again, you know? And obviously I think we, there's a, a lot of that maybe that needs to happen right now as a whole, you know, that I think we're all um, thinking about and questioning how we can create dialogue and understanding. Yeah. Thank you so much. It, it's I've never I haven't seen your work in person, so I'm just going on this, but it's very um, very enriching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks, Lynn. Um, our next question comes from Malvika. Um, Malvika, you should be able to activate your mic um, if you're ready. I am. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, I. Uh, First off, thank you so much for this beautiful talk. You're both so soft-spoken and have such generous minds. Um, it's really been a pleasure. Uh, my question is about water. Um, I loved so much the story you were telling about like thinking about all the water that we lose into the mattress, all of this like extraction, and where does it all go? And this, you know, as you said, this thought of like lacrima corpus, the body of waters, the body of tears and kind of, you know, how to carry it around on your person. Um, I think I, I love it as an affect and then also as like a atmospheric sensibility. I love that Lynn is drinking water now. Um, but, you know, having this affect of wetness, of extraction um, and there's of dryness. And there was a bit of a conversation going on in the chat about, you know, the water is what you were saying about sea water, like the waters of even in the biblical sense, like the 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 blood of the covenant versus the waters of the womb, right? That these are not just like a one-to-one -one metaphor. Um, right. Yeah, it, I just feel like um, it reminded me a bit of uh, the artist Patty Chang, whose work also has to do with like liquids, liquids and bodies of water. Um, and I was reading an interview with uh, that someone did with her in which um, they sort of said, uh, it, the writer was Astrid Nimanis, and she wrote about how, um, like the the feminist subjectivity has this uh, embodiment, and the embodiment embodiment is wateriness, right? The embodiment is this kind of wateriness and bodiness, and this flow. Um, and I guess my question is, I was wondering if, in a craft way, if you could tell us, or like if you can recall for yourself, the moment where you started more explicitly exploring this like entanglement of like human bodies and water bodies and history? I think, I mean, um, well, my name, Janaina, is, you know, my, my mom named me Janaina after the goddess of the water, you know, in Brazil, Brazilian religion. So obviously there was always a, a bit of a interest, like, why this name and because it's not a very usual name. Um, so obviously I, I was fascinated by that, but then I think it was a little bit like questioning a bit also like mythology. I did a piece, he, 
what that was called, he drowned in her eyes as she called him to follow, which was basically a performance that I did that um, I would dress up with, you know, little tears on my hands with water inside, basically extending my body into water. And it was kind of a, a mermaid performance. And um, because I was questioning, obviously, you know, where the idea of where does that come from? Why did we, the the uh, the sirens, the the mermaids that seduce sailors and ship make you know create shipwrecks and it's like this kind of demonic also idea of the woman that um, I was questioning basically and and then became the Walt Disney like sort of beautiful blonde siren like it all those. Things obviously fascinated me as a student, and I started like looking into into that. But um, and then it expanded into this physicality, and I think that I did a very simple piece early on where I basically went to the bathroom in my clothes, and then went under the shower and got completely wet, and went for a walk. And it was a very simple performance, but that performance kind of had an effect that was, to me, kind of uh, fascinating. Because, obviously, you get a lot of attention just because you're wet. And it was such a simple idea, you know, basically getting wet in your clothes. Then, you know, there's obviously immediately a reaction like something happened something happened to you, especially if it wasn't raining and you're walking around drenched with water, like something must have happened. And, and, and that kind of a, I think that was the first piece that I did that was like in, an immediate sort of translation that I tried to make it in a very simple way, trying to embody all those different ideas. I love that. Thank you so much. <laughs> you're welcome. Thanks, uh, Malvika. Uh, we just had a question come in from Christian Breed. Christian, I will pass you a mic now, or I can read on your behalf. Okay. Hi, yes. Sorry, I'm putting my video. Yes, you mentioned that the origin of your name uh, was from Candomblé religion. And I'm just very curious about the effect that Afro Brazilian spiritual practices have on your work. And if you could talk a little bit more about sort of the presence, if any, of candomblé in your process while you're going about making your work or thinking about it. I mean, I, I have a, 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 a lot of interest towards candomblé, but I also have very big respect. So, you know, when I moved, you know, my mom named me after, you know, Candomblé religion. She's Brazilian. She grew up in Brazil. And for her, this is a part of her religion. She's Catholic, but she also, I think, I think Brazil as a whole, all Brazilians growing up, you are surrounded by it somehow. There is a, a big presence everywhere, it's in the Northeast more maybe than in the South. Because, you know, there is a, a relationship to Catholicism, even in the churches, like you are surrounded by it. If you believe or if you're inside of it or not, there is, it is around you. So, and I moved to Salvador when I was studying in Hamburg because I was actually very interested in finding out more. Um, and I have to say, like, I think there is for me I have a very big respect, basically, because I feel you do have to have a lot of knowledge and be more initiated in it to even sort of, I, I wouldn't say that I use any of it for my work, so to say, because there is, it's, a, it's in a way, it's a sacred place, you know, like I understand, I, I, for me, it's more the idea of how fluid also the religion is. I, I'm fascinated with the idea that there is no good or bad, but there's all kinds of things in between. I think the 
the overall um, thinking and the, you know, the different gods and what they stand for. And I think I'm interested in that openness and in that otherworldliness where things are allowed in different ways, where things are, um, you know, there is basically, I think the idea of there, someone that there is no good and bad, which I think makes it a very different sort of place to think and think work in. So I think in that aspect, yes, you know, more about um, giving it all, again, like more flexibility of dialogue. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Um, thanks so much, Christian. Um, I'm going to be a little bit selfish and take the next question. Um, so I have a question about the sublime in your paintings. Um, normally when I think about the sublime in paintings like in the 19th century and moving forward, there's often some sort of like remnant or evidence of humanity um, in the painting, just like showing the scale between human and the sublime. And I've noticed that a lot of paintings in the Sean Kelly show possess the sublime quality, but they also convey a lack of human presence um, and evidence, um, sort of as if the sublime has like taken over completely. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. And if it's something you think about in your practice, um, sort of this presence or lack thereof of humans, um, I mean, I think that yeah. I think the human comes in there when as a you as an observer, you know, mm. in a way when you stand in front of a painting, you're creating this relationship, you know, as a human being um, looking at the painting. So I kind of think that this is more the space where. I try to dwell into almost like an abstraction of, you know, all those thoughts and the grandness of nature and, uh, but removing the, the human being as a, as a illustration in it, you know, I'm not very interested in, in making an, uh, an image of like the human being in nature, I prefer us as the observer to be, the human in front of the work, you know, in front of the painting, in front of nature, observing it. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, thank you so much. Um, for our final comment slash question, I'm gonna go to our publisher, Fong. Um, Fong, you should be able to turn on your mic now. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, that was an excellent question on the subject sublime, Catherine. And uh, thank you, Janaya. Good to see you and David. I enjoyed it so much. I love when get involved in the, the, the talk of the material and the uh, you know, techniques and you know process. And I just delighted to hear interlacing, you know, such concept interlacing that really have such a complex history itself. And, Thanks for that use of uses of word, David. And I really appreciate the duality of mark making, feel of vision, what else do you guys say? Nature of the image. I mean, there were so many great things were brought up during this talk. And to, to sort of follow in Catherine's question of the sublime, it's a very uh, concept that in a way, because of your mentioning of Goethe, I can't help but I, when I was in college in first class, one-on-one -on -one painting class, I was told to read Sir Eastlake, Book on Material Techniques. David, you probably remember that, who was a painter himself, a translator, and was the first director of the National Gallery of Art in London. And I remember he specifically talked about Goethe color in the terms of plus, and minus. Remember, it was addressed both to the eye, the emotion. In other words, take the color yellow and red, for example, which excite the lively, energetic feeling, as opposed to blues or whatnot, that evoke a sense of uh, melancholy or gloominess or whatnot, or coldness even. 
And I can't help but to look at your work and reminded myself that when Dalakwa, in his trip visiting to London, and he came to visit Turner uh, at the show at the Royal Academy, in the last minute, Turner, just before the, the opening rece reception began, he put the last few touches, palette knife on the paintings. And because your, your mention of the word conquer, you know, Janina, I can't help but to think in the military term, in the romantic way, because both Dalakwa and, and, and Turner share that similar interest in the supply. And where he saw what he was doing, Turner, Dalakwa said the, the, the general had finished, he just fired his last shot at the enemy. <laughs> So it's a very interesting concept in, in taking romanticism or sublime to the greater uh, conception heroic. So mm -hmm. they're working in, in the heroics or historical scale uh, relate to some of that lineage. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But what is so interesting though, you know, just, uh, just you know, thinking what David had mentioned, you know, between the swirling chaos, the deluge, uh, which actually in my last talk with uh, Julie uh, Maritou, we did talk about that similar sense of the deluge of the end of the world, the swirliness, which were mentioned in, um, in our friend, Pepper, uh, Pepper Kamel's book, Global Abstraction, the history of global abstraction. What is my question here? Lynn, help me out. I'm so excited with so many things and I'm <laughs> losing my thread of my question. <laughs> okay, so, so going back to Dalakwa, if you take, let's say, uh, Liberty leading the people, that's painted in 1830, I think. And then you take Turner, uh, the greatest painting, one of its, my favorite, Rain, Steam and Speed. That was painted, I think, a little bit later, maybe 1840 or something. The point is that there's a content for industrialization too. Both of them share. So my feeling that, that, that as much as the sublime exists in the painting, I believe there's a, I'm not so sure the lack of human presence there because you articulate so well when you say that the, the participant, the viewer is a human presence which at once reminded us so much of Casa Fiedrich, David mm -hmm. beautiful painting is called Mung Before the Sea, which mm -hmm. is big. Yes, so, I know this one. So exactly, yeah. exactly. So in other words, the Hmong is contemplate the, the, the violent and gloomy storm before him, the sea. So he's standing in the platform of earth, which is basically what you are inviting the viewer to do. Mm -hmm. That on the platform of the gallery, experience this massive. <laughs> what is the question here, David? Help me out again. <laughs> uh, okay, you know, I think my question is really regarding to the heroic and historical size reference, but at the same time, there is a sense of intimacy. So, how, how, how can you mediate in between that? Between mm -hmm. the heroic the monumentality of scale. Right, right. The intimacy of human touch. I think that, I mean, I did, I, I do think about that a lot because I think about the relationship, for instance, of making a, a small little paper sketch and how intimate that is, right? Like I was mentioning some of those drawings with, on the polyptic, you know, like I draw a lot like, you know, I have dinner, I'm reading, and then I start drawing on my living room table, which is a very intimate act. Those drawings are really reflections of uh, feelings of ideas. Of, it's a language. It's basically like writing a diary. So it is a very intimate, small drawing that I start composing and eventually becomes a big drawing. And I try to, which is always a thought in my head, when I started painting really large scale canvases, 
I wanted to have the same relationship to them as to my small sketches, you know, that I wouldn't lose from the intimacy to also the fluidity of the drawing. Because the first time I painted a, a very big mural, I tried to, you know, just in the, the idea of the size intimidated me because I had never painted uh, something that large. So I tried to think of different ways of doing it with projections, with like, cut, you know, making already a painting beforehand, cutting it and to have guidelines, all that. And when I got there, I did realize that if I would do that, I would be basically making an illustration of my own work. Mm -hmm. And I would be in a way killing my own work because all that intimacy, the gesture would be gone. Mm -hmm. So in that moment, I really started to try to imagine that actually that, you know, a piece of paper like this is the same as that giant canvas. And physically as well as mentally I should be able and I say conquer because in a way like with a small piece of paper we don't think of conquering because it is obvious that we can sort of manage that little piece of paper and then with a large canvas there is because of the size and it's it's intimidating because you think like how am I going to actually make this brushstroke grow from one side to the other without stopping or without, you know, at the, in the middle kind of going out of pain that are feeling insecure about the line. And I think that the challenge in sense for me has been that, like how to keep the intimacy reflected in that large scale format. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think this is for me something that I've, trying to keep in the work and that's why also like um, the, the the gestural and the, the physical part you know the, the agility to be able to handle it is really important in a way because obviously it prevents me from stopping in the middle of the process but um, I think it's a very interesting place you know to think about that and how to Deal. I think maybe there is a difference, you know, like, yeah, I wonder. No, I think it's an interesting thought, you know, but I do believe that for me that the, 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 the path and the way I try to relate to this is really trying to keep the idea of the intimate in the format, in the language, in the way I do it, and in the paintings in big to have the same process you know I paint alone those canvases like there is the same sort of I listen to music like it's in a way they are created in that same space the the scale doesn't mean that I need construction for it that I need this to be sort of you know 10 people helping me big scaffolds and all that I mean I had that illusion with the first one that I made that I would maybe need to pump it all up because of the scale. But then I kind of realized very quickly that it wasn't the case. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting uh, also, David, um, and everyone here, uh, especially those of you who attended uh, just on Monday when we welcome our friend Hashim Sakas uh, to come and talk about his curation in the, you know, the architectural Venice Biennale. And to the tail end, our friend Jory Graham, the poet, Jory brought up um, John Kitt's term, negative capability. And then it's refer actually now, thinking you just described what you just did. I can't help, you know, David, particularly the Kunin, very amazing painting, uh, which is now in the show with the Kunin and Sutin at the Born Foundation, a must be experience. Go. I wanna go there, I haven't seen it yet. I heard so much about it. It's so great. In any rate, the, the, uh, one of the paintings that referenced so deeply to um, John Kitts, because it was the Kunin only visit to, to Rome, I think it's 1960. 
where the the epitaph of Kit's tombstone say whose name is written on the water that was referenced and I can't help but to think of different way in which we capture the feeling of water. In other words, what your painting in your own bodily movement is so different than the Kunin's own. That was not, you know, mid seventies. So it just bring up all these amazing pictorial issue and processes of how we all manage to walk that thin strand of hair in between things. So for that, I just thank you. Super grateful for this talk. And then I must uh, go see the show ASAP, so. Yes, please do. <laughs> and congratulations, Janina. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. Thank you all for having me here. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. To be continued. To be continued. Yes, part one. <laughs> Back to you, Catherine. Uh, um, thanks so much, Fong. Um, I think this is a wonderful moment to transition to poetry. Um, as many of you know, we have a tradition of closing all of our events with a poetry reading. And I'm very excited to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Sarah Jean Grimm, to the Zoom stage. Um, Sarah Jean Grimm is the author of Soft Focus, as well as a founding editor of Powder Keg Magazine. She currently co-edits the press After Hours Editions and hosts Bank Holiday, which is a reading series in Catskill, New York. She lives in New York and works as a publicist at Catapult, Soft Skull, and Counterpoint Press. Sarah, um, I am passing you a mic now. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Janaina and David. That was fascinating. And thank you, Catherine, for the introduction. Uh, the Brooklyn Rail for having me. I have three poems in the June issue of the Rail, so I think I'm going to read two of those and then just two others before we all go enjoy our weekends. Um, speaking of weekends, this one starts deep in the work week. It's called Woman with Cake. I want to buy and eat and sleep well, so I marinate my emails in a professional tone. Whatever time I spend at this, burgers into value. These are damp and bready hours, which I can convert into tenancy. Meanwhile, 11 geese are commuting across somewhere's pale sky, and I'm increasingly wishing not to be seen. A zoo at night, a public caring. I don't want the climb or clench anymore. I want time to be my own. Let there be room enough to curl around a docile error, like the observations of a vacationer in bald eagle tie-dye or the assumptions of a docent with social feelings. I read somewhere about ancient sculptures of female drummers, mislabeled woman with cake, domestic totems in museums with their arousals and amusements, dormant but ample, anemic longings. Would I drizzle over all my beautiful cakes? Mm. Hog Lagoon. I knew a beautiful woman with the bruisiest ego like a foamy sunset, it undazzled. Vanity works like a dental pick, sharp at both ends. I don't pretend to roll the windows down in a Cadillac of hypocrisy and look out on some moral vista. No, I twirl my mercy like a baton and build suspense in the billowing. My heart can be so mutton. Mostly I observe the world with great affection. Otherwise it's disgust. If the field of my vision lands on something pitiful, I feel as grotesque as a diapered bear balancing on a ball. And also there is jeering, the universal sound of wanting something to fail. The sound my heart spontaneously makes when I consider bail bondsmen, oil tycoons, elephant poachers. I get sick with the simultaneity of knowing we're all in the mire together, inundated and overtopped. Maybe the squeaky soul gets the grace, a doomy souvenir. I never thought we would lie on velvet poofs, unjealous and braiding each other's hair, but I did hope there would be snacks. Um, here's a newer poem that was written at some point in the blur of the pandemic. It's called Mall Baby. It was a year of flaccid resolutions and frozen entrees 
Historically ordinary, how time ballooned and resisted rhythm. There was the day the blue barrel floated by, the day the hawk flew close enough for us to see its red tail, the day the squirrel brought its body weight and bread up the catalpa tree. Later, a stale, half-bitten baguette appeared on the patio table, like a picnic abandoned to bad weather. It's raining and I'm reading the news. There's a piece on the popularity of parks. Someone is quoted saying, when I'm in nature, I think natural thoughts. And I know what that's like. Here, you can buy your own beliefs while the sun makes another bid and people are airing out their despair. People are out playing Frisbee. People are out saving the economy. David Byrne says shopping is a feeling. I'm returned to the mall of my mind, the one still crowded with people and in the heart of Rome. For the piazza is not the mirror, but the mirage of a mall. Everyone is dressed in jewel tones there, though the quality of light is stale bread. To be part of the collective experience, you have to want something pointless. And it isn't embarrassing to want it publicly. I came of age at that mall, had my first kiss at that mall. I thought Dan's tongue tasted like hamburger. A high frequency security sound was piercing my ears. What I must have sensed was a sickness, maybe even an evil. The coins were rolling themselves and threatening. I was revolted, but I didn't stop there. And just one more for you, it's called Field Notes. It's rained every day in July in a precarious city where the act of looking up to admire the architecture contains the act of imagining future ruins. Slow violence lifting everything to beauty, a beauty that contains the terror of its own ending, like a Russian doll wherein the smallest doll has the largest appetite, the contents of the earth will devour the earth. Suspended in a calamity so incremental, I can't feel anything but wonder at the census of the birds nesting earlier to keep pace with the warming world. Wonder at the whale who will not let go of her dead calf, nosing it around the Pacific for 17 days of Lazarus longing. Wonder at the water found on Mars. Would you drink it? I would. I would drink it and go straight to bed. Waste not, want not. I don't know about that. I don't know about this colonial tendency to project one planet onto another as if earth is just a lobby for the next earth. Leech the sun from a flower and find a new field. Somewhere grasses aren't yellowing down. My fellow Americans, here's to my sense of adventure, flapping at half mast to my anger billowing aimlessly against its lid, to my dependency gridlocked with wonder at whether I or it ends first. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Sarah. Thank um, you. I agree with Igor in the chat that paired so perfectly with the paintings that we just explored. Um, and thank you again so much, uh, Johnina and David, um, and thank you everyone who tuned in and for your questions and thoughtful comments and love in the chat. Uh, this conversation will be available later on our YouTube for anyone who wants to visit uh, or reshare. Um, so it'll be there and please join us on Monday at 1 p.m. for a conversation celebrating 25 years of the Leroy Neiman Center for Print Studies. That conversation will feature Sanford Biggers Shatsia Sikander, Kiki Smith, Sarah Z, Rikrit Taravinich, and Tomas Vu. Uh, as always, we'll conclude with a poetry reading. Um, and you should all now be able to turn on your mics if you would like to say goodbye as you leave. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janaina. Thank you so much. Thanks, David. Thank you, Sarah. 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 Wonderful poetry, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you so Thank much. You. Very wonderful. Thank Thank you. You. Muchas gracias. Amazing <laughs> reading, Sarah. Woo! Thank you very much. What Have a good weekend, everyone. Wonderful weekend. <laughs> Bye, guys.